In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Amen, resuming our class uh, today. As we said, we'll dedicate a certain uh, big portion for the theory of evolution. So this was presented as part of a conference, and this will lecture over the next two hours will give us more depth into discussing this theory um, as in, in a little bit of, of detail besides to what we presented uh, last week in terms of the challenges to the theory of evolution. One of the biggest things we'll present today is uh, the source of information to prove that the described theory of evolution of as presented in the Darwinian form cannot account for reliably for the describing, explaining the origin of the species, the origin of life, the origin where life, how life started. So, um, evolution undeniably exists, but we shall portray borders for it. To put a, a kind of shell around it, that we say that when the climate crosses that shell, we we, we show that's very very sketchy and unreliable scientific claims or far-fetched scientific claims that are challengeable very easily. Science presents it as borderless, and this is a type of faith. You believe in evolution first, then do science, as we described by the judicial decision. So this is the in the borders of it is what we'll focus on today that the 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 information enigma or uh, that we carry our body carries a lot of information stored in a specific place um, and this amount of information is a huge challenge to the Darwinian evolution theory. Um, scripture and the fathers, Cambrian explosion consequences of adaptations, probability of chance. All of these are general uh, challenges to it, but we'll focus in this talk on the information uh, enigma. It's a, a purely scientific approach to, um, the ch to this theory. Origin of life equals origin of information. Information is um, not just a repetition of a certain letter, uh, information manifests itself into composing music, sign language, uh, programming, uh, hieroglyphics, um, digital type of information in terms of ones and zeros, compu I mean, binary information. Um, and this is uh, what we'll talk to present the case that information informing a species is very, very, very large and very specific that it cannot be formed by random. So natural selection plus mutation in S plus M cannot explain systematically, systematic means in an organized way, it's all sketchy theories, the origin of life. Origin of life happening by chance is improbable to the highest degree. Uh, in order to be scientifically, we didn't say impossible. In fact, it is, but it's improbable to the point that it's in, the probability is zero. For natural selection plus mutation to occur, reproduction, replication, because natural selection happens when things reproduce. When they reproduce, the, the, the life, survival of the fittest means that the, the, what will continue is what's more fitting and more useful for the organism rather than what's not. Uh, and the mutation has to be kept at a certain level, a low level, uh, that that not every organism is mutated, then it will it will become it will die because it's not functioning properly. But it relies on on reproduction. But it has to, reproduction has to offer occur first for natural selection to take effect to start working because it's called selection. So selecting among what's reproduced from the parents of what or whatever reproduced it. So reproduction or replication, the ability of a cell to replicate itself must be in place already. So we're going to show, to, uh, to pose this question, how natural selection can describe the beginning of life if natural selection does not start till life starts, which is causing the cell to replicate or copy itself. So how can 
a mechanism that works after copying is in place can be used to describe how the cell existed in the first place. So that's in itself a definition doesn't hold water. Necessity. Self-organization in biochemistry resulting from chemical affinity leads to predicted pattern. The affinities are absent along the vertical axis of the DNA module. These are just the, the things we'll talk about. It will be explained in detail. So this is just the order or the content. Uh, so the chance will not be enough to create life, to come by chance, as we said in, second, in the second bullet. So there has to be laws that will help this, this chance to work faster or to work more correctly. And that, that necessity means the laws. And these laws are existing through biochemistry forces or affinity. Affinity means a certain, a certain material uh, uh, or certain compounds that attract together or certain elements that attract together. And they say that this will work with randomness to make it directed to form a, a life. We're going to explain now, or in this thought, that this itself, in itself has a big challenge in it. Explanatory models of origin of life always at some, um, at some point, not some point, at some point, uh, they make a leap which requires specified information or specified com um, com amount of data that will cause something to form. So in any model they put, you don't pay attention, but at a certain point, there is a step they take, and this step requires information, and you don't notice it. But anything requires information begs the question, where does the information come from? So notice the elegance of what evolutionary people put the theory as. They put it in a certain of a process that ha happens by itself. Part of it, yes, it can happen by itself based on chemical reactions or biochemistry affinities. But at some point, they go to a certain step, but that step requires information to form. And that's what we, you as a student don't pay attention to ask the question, this part requires information, and it seems that it's, it can happen. So here is the biggest uh, importance of our talk is to understand how to pick up on where information is required. RNA model for origin of life is an example of this. Uh, but this, prob this, this, this uh, uh, talk is, is, is already capturing a lot of concepts. The RNA model um, uh, to, to spot where the information is needed requires another more in-depth uh, in the theory of evolution. I know that part, it's prepared, um, but it will, it will need more time to be covered. And I think you'll have enough of a model of a challenge with what we have here that it will pose very, very strong uh, borders or question mark to evolutionary theorists uh, that information, where does it come from? Information enigma, specified complexity, protein 3D shape, order of the amino acid in protein, protein synthesis from mRNA is similar to the execution of computer code. Where does the information come from? Future research information to build protein is massively specific, but there is also information to build an organism. Uh, future research found in, in Darwin's dilemma, which is how do cells, the stem cells know what to form into, where this information is stored, where the stem cells in the beginning of the existence after fertilization of the over ovum, how these cells with time know where is an information stored that every cell shapes in a different thing. Cells that are going to be eyes, cells that are going to be hair, cells that are going to be bones. Um, that's future for any person who wants to study further, that this is a, another <laughs> layer of information that, that has to be coming from somewhere. So Darwin's model started, let's start now in, in getting into the core of it, of the survival of fittest version, natural selection plus mutation. It is ingenious that he is using the present to understand the past. We shall use the same approach, what forces now are in motion, 
and prevailing to give us understanding of the past. Evolution theory, Richard Dawkins said, Darwin gave us design without a designer. That's the claim that he basically explained, we don't need God for life to begin. This means that natural selection can mimic the power of intelligent design without an intelligent designer. It is a completely unguided process, yet intelligent. In other words, as Meyer phrases it, that Darwinian intelligent design gives us life that looks designed, though it is purely undesigned. Though it looks designed, but it is through a purely undirected natural process, which can induce that appearance without it itself being designed or guided in any way. Again, Dawkins, Darwin gave us design without the need for a designer. This means that natural selection can mimic the power of intelligent design without an intelligent designer. Mimic any yani acts as can replace. It is a completely unguided process. Evolution acts as this intelligent design. In other words, as Meyer, Meyer is uh, Stephen Meyer, who really is the main in, in inspiration behind this approach in formation enigma. As Meyer phrases it, phrases it, phrases it that Darwinian intelligent design gives us life that looks designed, but it is through a purely undirected natural process. So there's no God. It looks designed, but the designer is the evolution itself, which can induce that appearance, can give us this appearance of design, but there is no designer behind it, without it itself being designed or guided in any way. So Dawkins says that God, Darwin gave us God, basically, through science. That is the evolution theory. They can make species look designed but it's by evolution, and hence God definitely doesn't exist because the science shows us that through Darwin's explanation that how species came about, how they evolve, and how it, they look intelligent through the process of evolution, and there is no intelligent design. Prior to this, uh, in, in the past century, in the 19th century, the most magical thing was basically the um, adaptation. How to study that fish have gills because they live in, in, the, in the sea. How sheep in Scotland have wool, thicker wool because of the, of the um, weather. So breeders can generate pure breeds of certain types of sheep and they can control the process. That was basically the cool thing in the 19th century. Pure breeds of the certain type of sheep by making sure that the parents are of that breed. Um, so assume that there is a sheep that is adapted to living in winter. We shall call them the winter sheep. So if hypothetically there are seven consecutive winters, then one would get after seven years, hypothetical number in the example being stated, only one type of sheep, which is the winter sheep. So we have a way to control what type of sheep we can get. That's the whole uh, theme here. Darwin claims that nature can do this. So what breeders can do, nature can do it. It can generate a certain species. So, but here, adaptation is that people can use adaptation by controlling by who the parents are that consecutively you can focus that after several generations, you get that type consistently. Darwin says, no, not only this, but nature can do that, that's what the breeders are doing. And that's the natural selection process. There's a crucial question. Is adaptation the only appearance of design? So, 
Dawkins says that Darwin gave us God, basically. That's the evolutionary theory that can make things appear designed without the need for a designer because species adapt. So that raises the question, is adaptation, is the only appearance of design? We don't see, we don't see design in other things, that there is a designer behind it? That's a very important question because at, the answer is, is no, because adaptation is not the only appearance of design, as we'll see, that information is really the appearance of design, the appearance of, of, a, of a designer. If not, does natural selection explain all other forms of design? So if adaptation is not the only form of design, what are the other ones? And if there are other ones, does natural selection is able to explain all the other forms of design? Well, the question here, if there is design, is there a designer or not? Dawkins says, no, there isn't. Darwin gave us the designer, and that's an evolutionary theory. So, but based on, on this, it's because of adaptation of the natural selection. So the question is, is, not, is adaptation the only appearance that there is design? If the answer is yes, we're gonna challenge and says no. There's other things that says there's appearance of design. If the answer is no, then does natural selection explain adaptation and all of the other uh, symptoms of design? And that's basically the, 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 the whole philosophy behind it, is that adaptation is not only the only appearance of design, in fact, information is the main proof that there is a designer, a lot of information to generate a species. Second, natural selection cannot explain all, because as we just said, natural selection works after replication system is already in motion, that uh, there is a replication ability. And we have to explain how, how, how that replication mechanism comes from, because cells with, with chemistry are not enough to create that these cells can copy themselves. And natural selection happens only after replication takes place. So uh, the big challenge to explain that natural selection can explain why in the first place cells came, the very first cell. It's a cyclic logic. Okay. Recently, as stated by Meyer, there is an increasing call for a neo-Darwinian theory that can match the new specific scientific of more and more evidence for the presence of design in biological systems. And I'm going to discuss this more evidence. 19th century versus today. In the 19th century, the cell is believed to be a globule of plasma. And hence, science was satisfied that Darwin's theory offered the full explanation because the cell was just a nucleus, membrane, and there's the cytoplasm or the plasma in the middle. And that was it. There was no known of what since, well, how much detail there is in the cell. And that also the chemical evolution was full supported by the Darwinian theory. And the tree of life of Darwin, which we saw last time, the single skin at the bottom, and then it becomes different species. I would go, go top, which is the axis of time up. Be, you see more species developing. At the very base, there is the origin of the first form of life. Then it branches till we get at the top all forms of life. Darwin, however, did not attempt to solve the origin of life systematically. Darwin described the natural selection process and hypothesized that it explains life without systematically explaining how exactly life started. He just focused on the natural selection, but he did not go in a rigorous way to say how this natural selection was able to create the first cell. He did not. However, Darwin gave us the genius of who to look into of how, excuse me, of how to look into the past using the present. So that's basically the ingenuity that we talked about also last time is that Darwin's ingenuity is that he looked at, give us a system called natural selection, which is in motion to make us look into the past. But he concluded about the past that the life came from a single cell. We were going to challenge this because that does not mean this is the conclusion. We conclude from natural selection by looking at the amount of information now in the cell that natural selection occurs, but the origin of life is not satisfiably explained by the Darwinian natural selection process. He cannot give a systematic, clear, 
rigorous approach. He just draw the, drew the tree of life and explained the process of natural selection without going to explain exactly how the natural selection explains how life originated. That's very important to remember this concept that I talked about in the past 10 minutes, extremely important. Till now, till the, the miracle of the 20th century in biology or biochemistry, which is the double helix. In 1953 by J.D. Watson and Crick in the paper in Nature, April 25th, 1953. From the past to the present, the double helix. The molecular biology revolution happened via the discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule, the double helix by Watson and Crick. It was discovered that the DNA molecule does not only have the double helix shape, but more importantly, it carries a sequential, in order, arrangement of binary information and in the form of letters or bonds of letters, as if you remember from last time, the C and the T and the G and the U. Information that looks like letters in a sentence where there is an ordered, ordered, not random, ordered. Ordered is very is, is a clear question mark. Who puts that order? Because that order, if it's reversed, things will not work. When you write a sentence, I want to go to school, the order of the letters is put by you in order to give this meaning. The W and the A and the T and all of these are letters. If they are put randomly, the same letters but randomized, it will not give that meaning. It might give nothing. Uh, it will probably give nothing. Maybe you'll get uh, an or on or two uh, as, as something that would make sense, but the rest will be jarbled. Where there is an ordered sequence, information being conveyed. Ordered information that has a specific order being given in order for a certain functionality. Proteins carry, among many others, the following jobs in the living organisms act as enzymes, catalysts to reactions. That's what enzymes are. Act as the parts of machines that carry out different functions in the body, as we looked last time, the spiceoplasm, the ribosome, um, and, and all, of, all of the functionality that happens in the body, if you clicked at the link last time, we provided about what, what, are, pro what are the proteins for, um, you will see these um, functions in the body. Proteins are made of amino acids. The sequence of these amino acids is unique to every protein. But also, un understand this hundredfold times. <laughs> but also, a protein molecule has a three dimensional structure. So, not only the order of the amino acid, but it's folded, wrapped in a way, a 3D unique 3D shape that makes the protein function. The shape also helps in the function. That is, that is for me, um, is, is impossible to grasp easily. And it's an amazing um, challenge that these things are random because not only the order is specified, but the shape is also unique. And it's part of the functionality of what the protein will do. The order of the amino acid as well as the 3D structure of the molecule are two main attributes that, that defines the protein and the function that it will perform. It was discovered that these functions fit with the protein as hand and glove. So if the protein doesn't have that shape, it cannot do that function. Example of the 3D structure <clears throat> besides the order of the amino cell. Example of such phenomenon is the breaking apart the two-part sugar molecule. We can see the magnificent structure fit between the protein molecule and the sugar molecule. So here is the sugar molecule. Here is the enzyme or the protein molecule. molecule. The, in order for the enzyme to break this bonding, the 3D shape of it makes it fit in it like this, that's due to the 3D shape functionality of the protein. And the binding of the substrate and the enzyme places stress on the glucose fructose bond, it physically breaks it. 
and the bond breaks. Why does it break? Because this connection in the sugar molecule, when it fits into the protein molecule this way, this is stretched and the tension on it causes it to break. Products are released and the enzyme is free to bind other substrates. B breaks into glucose and fructose. So this is an example of how the protein 3D shape, not just the order of the amino acid, um, carries a fun. This is, this is uh, as an engineer, to form part of cars that fit together. There's a computer system. You send the information to a lathe, uh, or a, some, some numerical computer-driven machine that when you put for it the program, it forms the machine exactly, it forms the machine part exactly like this, whatever the gear or the camshaft or whatever your manufacturing is. This is called CAD CAM, computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing, where there's code that you put it to the machine, the machine executes this code, and the, the, all of the tools of the machine act on a piece of metal to give it that shape. So you store the shape in the form of code. Somehow this is done in the in the body, in the cell, in, in, in proteins that take in, in other set of proteins that take the amino acid order that we described last time and, and, and shapes it this way. Uh, it gets it right every time, otherwise it will not function. So big question mark, where does the information to fold the protein, where does it come from? Not where is it stored? But where does that information come from? Where does the information of, of the human person in the DNA come from? It's a long amount of information. The information in the DNA. The DNA molecule has instructions that encodes how to build each type of protein that is used in the living organism. This is what we covered last time in the protein building from mRNA and tRNA and the codons and the anticodons that and the execution of this part as computer code to give us the amino acid order which forms a protein these instructions have the exact function of a computer code that when executed produces a certain intended outcome which is what is known as the transcription and translation we we'll covered this last time but here it is in summary with all of the engines working so here is the cell, the nucleus, the cytoplasm, and in it, in the nucleus, there is the DNA, which is in the 30s. This is what just what's known about the cell, till in the 53, the discovering of the double helix, and later on by Collins, the discovery of the least letters, the order, which is the genome project, finding out the whole order of the DNA that describes the human, that describes the species, but mainly for the human DNA. So the DNA gets opened, double helix unwinds, and then the transcription, this is the transcription part and the translation part. Um, and this part, some, some order above it says that we need a certain protein and this part contains it. And it copies itself in the complementary order. So the C, because it bonds with the G, generates a, these complementary orders, these ones becomes the messenger RNA, goes out of the membrane of the cell into the cytoplasm, and it starts being translated, which is this part. Each three are a codon, comes with it the matching anticodon, and each one is carrying an amino acid, and they get connected one after the other till you get to the end of the mRNA and you have formed the protein. The transcription and translation that is involved in the protein synthesis. More detail about it here. It starts the double-stranded DNA in the cell nucleus. And that's a DNA in the cell in the nucleus. The strands of DNA unzip and allow free RNA nucleotides to link with the separated strands. Then this mRNA 
the free RNA nucleotide approaches an unzipped DNA molecule to pair its base with DNA nucleotide. Then this mRNA moves from the cell nucleus to a ribosome in the cytoplasm. There it acts as a pattern on which amino acids transported by transfer RNA, tRNA, form protein. So this ribosome is the factory in which this execution of the code happens inside it. This is basically where, where this closed room where the mRNA gets translated using the matching anticodon to each set of codons. Each one is a triplet. And they carry the amino acids. And this one just to give its own, and this one was the next one, and so on and so on. And it forms the growing polypeptide, polypeptide, all of these are the peptides or the amino acids. Polypeptide chain eventually constitutes a protein. And don't forget, this goes out into another machine that gives it the shape of another computer that makes it to look, have a 3D shape that would match its functionality in the body. And the code here, the direction of motion, ribosome moves left to right among mRNA. It, it, it's basically this factory that knows how to move at the three codons at a time to execute it and to form the protein. It's two parts. The transcription, where the division of the DNA, uh, RNA, uh, sorry, DNA and gives the nucleobases, which is the C or the T or the G or the U. And it's called ribonucleic acid, RNA. The deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, when it opens, it can give, by the process we explained before, the pairing with when it opens, it generates this, the RNA. Part two, the translation, where the um, RNA, mRNA messenger gets paired this way in the ribosome by a tRNA that carries the anticodon, carrying on top of it the amino acid, and gets executed as a program code one by one, th three at a time, one instruction at a time. And the ribosome here, divided into three partitions, does this operation where that's called the translation. So part one is the transcription, part two is the translation. This we covered last time, but here it's more clear to show the engine of a computer acting on code that gets generated by some higher level says, I need this protein, this is the part that contains it, separate here the DNA, get this part copy, splice it, get it out of the cytoplasm, and get the ribosome to jump on it, and it will bring the matching T, RNA, and form the protein. I believe that the, all of these have to exist at the same time to get protein, which is the source of life, and it's get done by protein. So remember, specified complexity and a chicken and egg problem, because which one happened first? And that's why we read last time, biologists despair of explaining the evolutionary path that would lead to forming this machinery. How did things evolve that these things acted together to form this complex system? And that's why they started maybe probably this acted like this, this acted like these surfaces, catalytic surfaces, because it's all, that's called all the hypothesis. So they observed, they formed the hypothesis, experimentation and conclusion are missing, which will form the scientific theory. The scientific theory is observation, form a hypothesis, do experiments, do a conclusion. And the experiments can go back and modify the hypothesis. This loop keep happens till you form the conclusive results that how this conclusion supports the first step number one, the observation. Observation, form a hypothesis, experiment to prove the hypothesis, form a conclusion about, about your experimentation to support what you originally proposed or to support the observations. This here stops at number two. Always observe and come up with a hypothesis and very difficult 
to support proving this hypothesis that these things came through evolution. So remember, I keep reminding you, specified complexity, very, very, very many, which is, means many moving parts, a complex system with a specific piece doing every part, that's specified complexity. These systems have a chicken and egg quality, which is they all have to exist at the same time in order to do the functionality. And there is information in that system to make it do this. This information is knowing where the mRNA part that will generate this protein, the mRNA order of the codons in order to generate this protein, because this order is very specific for that protein. So this order was not random. So information is encoded. And separate from this, which is a challenge to the evolution theory, is that the tree of life has many, many gaps. So specified complexity, chicken and egg, containing information, very specific information about the task and execution of the task. And evolution theory in terms of the species have so many, many gaps. And we added, of course, the randomness, Cambrian explosion. All of these are arguments that are stacked together in order to um, challenge that the evolutionary theory as it is used to explain the origin of life. Evolutionary theory to explain adaptation, great enough, sure. But evolutionary theory to explain the origin of life, no, hit, well, hold on a minute. We have now these challenges for you. So I'm repeating this concept in order that we take ourselves in, in baby steps, understanding to form logically what is the argument. So systems show specified complexity. Systems show that the, all of the parts have to exist for it to carry out this, this task is supposed to do. Systems show there are lot, lots of amount of information to do this task. The ribosomes have to do what they are supposed to do. The spliceosome have to know where to splice. The mRNA has a certain order of the, of the codons in order to generate the protein. The DNA in itself has all of this ordered information. Um, so this, the presence of information is extremely uh, uh, questioning of, of, of the evolution theory for randomness that doesn't have any foresight to have all of these things together. So um, we are challenging now, as we become clear, using evolutionary theory to explain the origin where life came from with all of these complex systems operating in order for life to, to continue and to start because everything is from proteins. So which came first? Um, okay. So here is the amino acid being formed as the tRNA comes and connects to the mRNA. And where it attaches, it doesn't matter, the attachment is called uh, ACC. Um, these are called, the, 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 the nucleotides that attach the amino acid are indifferent to what amino acid attaches to the uh, tRNA. The tRNA in itself is not something simple. It actually has a, also a 3D fold shape. So the complexity is just, uh, there's no end to how complex each piece is. So the, DR, the DNA information is digital. It's either the G or the U or the A and the T. We're gonna go, get to the names of these later if we need to know them. You can, uh, I, I don't care to remember them. That's not my background. What matters to me is that who attaches to who and it's a digital type of information. It's not a waveform of sound like continuous curve. It's a letters, certain specific nucleotides uh, that attach together, or certain specific uh, components of a digital form. Like letters in a book are a digital form. Music notes are a digital form. Um, this order of these nucleotides is a digital form as well. Um, copied, because your DNA copies itself in order for you to grow and to generate cells that are generated. They have a copy of the DNA of the cells that give the existence, transported, uh, executed as a computer code to direct the construction of each protein, the order of the amino acid as well as the 3D shape. So each protein 
two things, the order of the amino acids and the shape, the 3D shape of the protein. Very specific, very large, 3.2 billion in the whole DNA sequence of the human. The construction is done in a chemical factory called ribosome, which is this part that encloses where the TNA latches through the anticodon connection to the codon by the nucleotides, uh, the, the G attaching to the, to the U and the A attaching to the T. The amino acid folds into 3D structure in another factory, which we'll not cover here. I haven't studied it, but it's, it's another um, extremely complex addition to the already complex um, uh, process that we're in. Here is the code, uh, the, the, all of the amino acids, all of the, sorry, the codons, and here is the name of the structures of, of all of their um, uh, summary, the, the, all of the names of the nucleotides that are used in, 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 in the body, in the mRNA, and uh, to, to, to form the codons and the anticodons. And that's basically their names for anybody who's interested to know them. For me, knowing it, that it, it is of, uh, of uh, digital type, like it's, it's each one is separate by itself, this is to call digital information, letters. But these letters refer to chemicals here. So reiterating, we have a program being executed as code to generate a protein. And here it is. The program is the mRNA. The mRNA, the execution of it is the matching tRNA comes and they come in order and each one carries a, a, an amino acid and they get connected and at the end you have the whole protein. We read this last time, I'm reiterating it here, Richard, Dawk Richard Dawkins agrees the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. Apart from the differences in jargon, the pages of a molecular biology journal might be interchanged with those of a computer engineering journal. Journal. This is from last time, as we said, the fetch, decode, and execute cycle to uh, mimic, to, as an as a analogy to what's happening in the, in the cell. So fetch, for generated, means bring the code, decode it, which, which anticodon needs to connect to it. If this is ACT, then the, the T connects to an A, the G connects to a C, the A connects to a T. So decode it, and then execute, which means part of the decoding is that you're carrying the amino acid that will get connected to the previous part of the chain to form another link in the chain to form the whole protein. So it's exactly like, the, this architecture by the way is called, this one on the left is for computer uh, engineers or computer uh, engineering uh, graduates. It's called the von Neumann architecture. There's other architectures called the RISC and several ones because this has limitations uh, was any, not related to our class here, but just for you to know that this is exactly what we see happening in the protein. Fetch, decode, and execute. So the DNA carries information in the form of an arranged sequence to form the protein in a specific amino acid order, as well as structure. So the ordered sequence stored in the DNA as a computer act as act as a computer code that generates a certain ordered output as well as a CAD CAM tool that generates the 3D structure. So the two, the two steps, you form the order, which is with this transcription translation mechanism. And after the whole protein is formed, another part which we have not explained because of my ignorance about it, but it's enough for me, the complexity that we have here, just to state that this gets folded to form a 3D structure. The DNA enigma is, the enigma is like miracle or like the, the part that we cannot wrap our head around not the structure of the DNA that it's formed in, in this helix. It's, a, it's an amazing discovery. Not where the information resides, which is the connection, the connections between the A and the, and, and the T and the C and the G. This is actually a hydrogen bomb. From reading, not, not from my previous knowledge, this is from reading in this, in this topic. It's not the structure that it's helix. It's not that that information is in it in this form. 
not what information does, which is forming protein, that's in itself is, is amazing, but that's still not the enigma. Although it reveals that it acts as a computer code that performs a certain specific function and can never tolerate randomness. You have to form the proteins correctly, otherwise the, the, the organism cannot function. It cannot separate trial and support. It cannot support trial and error. All of this is still not the enigma, although all of them are miracles of, 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 of discovery that just amazing systems at work here are extremely complex. They have to all exist together and they contain information. So the enigma is where does this information come from? This is the, 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 the billion dollar question. Who stored these in that order? And it's not a short storage, and it cannot be reversed. Any two cannot be reversed. So where the information, this is the information enigma, where the information came from, because this is the source of all things functioning properly. The order, exactly as you form music, when you listen to the music, who composed this order of notes? Because a piano with random playing of notes on it will not generate music that I would like to listen to. But when I like a certain piece of music, someone ordered the notes that when somebody takes these notes and plays them, the miracle is not in the one who plays the piano. The miracle is in the one who wrote the notes that when, you, when it gets played, it generates this music. This is exactly what's happening. Who wrote the notes that generates this piece of music? Where did the notes come from? Where did this order come from? How this digital code did come to be stored in the molecule. So before we get there, we amazingly, amazingly, which is for me, got me to jump into this. And thanks to Stephen Meyer, who's the one behind this, um, be, behind the, 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 the inside the cell work. Uh, it just connects with me personally because of information theory and communication theory. And this um, happens to be the background of my undergrad and, of course, in, in computer systems and automatic control systems, heavily, heavily containing digital information. But digital information, can I, can I measure information? And it turns out to be yes. And, and, and that became the father of digital communication, which is the foundation of all the cell phones all of the hard drives, all of the cryptography of data so that it can be locked and unlocked, how to take this data and deal with, how to compress it, how to uncompress it in order to make it shorter to send from one place to another. There is lossy compression where you lose part of the data, but you can still use what's left, which is used a lot in imaging. That's actually JPEG, JPEG extension of files is a compressed image. It lost information. You cannot recover what, lo what you lost, called lossy. Or lossless compression, which is JBIG. JBIG is used in compressing documents. When you compress a Word document, you cannot lose parts of the document. You cannot lose paragraphs or letters. You, have to you can compress it in a, in a, in a lossless way. There is cert certain very clear signs. It's called information that takes information and can do whatever digital information and can do lots of things on it. Measure the amount of information it contains. It helps you in compressing and then compressing it. It helps you in sending it from place to another, which is how your cell phone works and sends data from one place to another, voice, be it voice or, or any other form. This field uh, became scientific or measured very well when you measure information, digital information. The father of this field, well, the father of digital information, and digital communication is Shannon, Claude Shannon. So he said, information is based on probability. Probability is based on when a letter occurs in a book, what is the probability of this letter occurring um, in a paragraph or, or the next letter to be this one after the current one? So this, we call these symbols, any letter, any piece of music, any type of digital information, one piece of it is called the symbol that's uniquely known. It happens in digital systems, the symbol to be either one or a zero. Uh, in the letters of a book, that will be the alphabet. Each, each letter is called the symbol. Uh, so the probability of a symbol 
or the information that a symbol carries in a certain message is inversely proportional to the probability of that letter occurring. So if the letter occurs very often, it doesn't carry too much information because very probably you will see it again. So it doesn't convey much information. If it occurs very rarely, then the appearance of this letter gives a lot of information because it doesn't appear a lot, so it carries more information. The, the word information here is a measure of, of, of related to the, to the engineering approach of information theory. It doesn't mean information like I tell you a secret as, as information. So take it at this because it's hard if you have not studied um, that field to, 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 to understand it. Just I wanted to convey for, to you is that information is measurable. You can measure it and has a, it has a value. So the um, information that a, sent, a certain symbol carries in a message or in a computer uh, uh, um, message in form of one and zeros uh, is equal to the log of the one of the probability of that symbol appearing. So let us understand the concept of information further. Information is related to elimination or reduction of uncertainty. Reduction of uncertainty. And uncertainty is measured by probability of an event. So when something, I'm so sure it happens, means that probability is one, then it doesn't carry much information because I know it will happen. That's just to think about it in, a, in an easy way. If, if an event is 50-50 to happen, then it carries the maximum amount of information. And, or, or, so, excuse me, a larger amount of information. So it's a, it depends on how much probability it would happen. So probability of one, something for sure will happen, has no information because I know it will happen. But something that is randomly to happen, then it, it's, its existence or that value adds information or gives information depending on how random this letter happens, the probability. So information is related to eliminating uncertainty. Uncertainty is measured, uncertainty means this will happen or not, is measured by probability. An event of probability equals to one means that this event is certain. Inversely, an event of probability zero means that it will not, certainly will not happen. So incre information increases by removing the uncertainty, which means increasing the probability. So the more uncertainty is reduced means the more support to an event means the more information is conveyed. A coin has two faces. Each face can appear by half because either heads or tails. So it's 50-50. A die has six faces. Each face can appear with a probability of one six. Hence, with the coin, I am eliminating less uncertainty so that a certain face would appear. While with the die, it has Zahra. I am eliminating five, six more uncertainty. For what the coin, it's, it, I'm eliminating one, fadili one. In the terms of the die, when I eliminate one, fadili five, six. So that one of the faces would appear. Die is conveying more information because it carries more faces. It can be stated backwards. So in order to predict that the die will fall on face more than another, you will have to know more information in the case of the die compared to the case of the coin. Because the die has more outcomes, one of six faces, than the coin, sorry, not that the die. Actually, let me fix it now because it's very confusing, than the coin. Applying this to DNA, there has to be a huge amount of information and this information has to be encoded correctly in order to get the correct amino acid sequence that forms a certain protein. Means if I have two faces, it carries less information. If I have six faces, it carries more information. In the DNA, it has 3.2 billion letters in the DNA, so it carries 
huge amount of information. I'm conveying to you a very systematic way, not what Darwin said, evolution, therefore, origin of the species, life came about from a single cell. That's what we said at the beginning. He doesn't have a systematic way of proving that evolution can account for the origin of life. Darwin did, have a, did not have a systematic way in proving that evolutionary mechanism that he discovered can account for the origin of life. Because we're presenting here systematically that when you have more outcomes, you have more information. When you have more variability, more flexibility, you have more inf ability to carry information. If I have a coin, I can carry only heads or tails. If I have a die, it has Zahra, I can carry, can carry from one to six. If I have 3.2 billion, if you carry 28 letters of the alphabet, you can form any book. This is how much flexibility the alphabet gives you. If you have the notes of the music, you can form whatever music you have because you can put the notes on these five lines and above it and below it. This is what I'm trying to convey with the more variables or the more outcomes you have, the more ability to carry and convey information. So the DNA is not where the information is stored in the form of chemicals. Why is it double helix? It's about where this amount of information that's ordered, certain order, where does it come from? And I'm presenting here, this is what I love about it, is that marrying the information theory, digital information theory measurement to what we see in the DNA in a very, very unique way. So here, what we present to challenge evolution theory, Darwin did not present a systematic way of explaining how what he discovered can explain the origin of life. Um, us, we're presenting a systematic way looking at the system that is at works, which is the DNA now, how such a system carry a huge amount of information that can be put in any order because it's very flexible. And we're going to get into this point, um, which we'll describe it later, but can be put to carry a huge amount of information. And that information has a certain order that is not random. So this order with 3.2 billion letters, which with 28 only, I can write a book, any book, that's the alphabet, with some rules of the grammar that tie these letters together, let alone with this huge order of this information. So I hope you get exactly the core of what is the information enigma. And systematically, I am showing you here how to look at information theory as a measure to give this. And I give the credit to Stephen Meyer because through his speech, you work, were able to capture this. It is just because of the understanding of information theory and communication theory and digital information. It helps very much to capture this marriage. And I'm enjoying it as I'm um, showing you the systematic way of challenging evolution and biology and biochemistry measures and other measures will not be able to capture this link. You have to have a computer science or a computer engineering measure in order to capture the probability, the coding, and the information theory and the communication theory. And this is not the end of it. There is another part that's coming that will wow amazingly, it proves beyond really reasonable doubt that information has to come from a source outside the DNA, has to be put in the DNA. Uh, not biologically, but this is the DNA uh, in itself does not generate the information. The DNA is just the hard drive that contains the information. Again, the DNA does not generate the information. The DNA contains the information. That's why the information enigma is not the double helix, is not the, that it's contained in this form. The information enigma is that where does this information come from? As having a hard drive with a lot of information, input data on it, sorry, a lot of important files on it, it doesn't matter the, the brand of the hard drive. It doesn't matter the size of the hard drive. It, what matters, who put these files here with this very important files on it, inform, or data in it? 
this information is so huge and precise, specific complexity with, with a piece of it is executed, it produces amino acid, which is a piece of the DNA gets executed. It uh, generates amino acid that is one in 10 to the power seven, seven, 77 in the case of a modest 150 amino acid long protein, one with, which we described in the past in the lecture of last week. So where does this astronomical amount of information come from? Who wrote these files? Who composed this music? It's not the piano that's a miracle. It's not the one who plays the piano that's a miracle. It's not the one who designed the hard drive that's a miracle. It's not the hard drive itself is the miracle, but it's the, the type of files on it that when I open it, it's whatever the files are. Or when I take this note and put it on the piano and gets this music. The, the, it's a, who wrote this piece of music? Who wrote these files? Who put this information, this order, to make the, the organism function this way? or to define the organism, because it has the identity of the organism. Chance and necessity and combinatorics explosion. So this is, George Wald asserts that time is infinite, hence the impossible becomes possible, becomes probable, becomes certain, which is now an unacceptable theory because of the Cambrian explosion that all things appeared very quickly, so time wasn't infinite to form life. So the implication is that anything can happen given enough time or probabilistic opportunities. In the context of protein synthesis, there is a higher number of false combinations, as we mentioned, being in the order of 10 to the power 77 versus one correct combination. The only way to overcome this either, to assume that the number of proteins are so large that it is large number of combinations can give the same result as that one protein. So any, any type of amino acid order would work, not one in 10 to the power 77, let's say 10 to the power 20 and 10 to the power 77 would work. Or, well, let's challenge this. The answer is, this concept is challenged by the fact that, that it is not only the order of the amino acid that is important, but also the 3D shape structure. So hypothetically, if the amino acid order is correct, still the 3D fold of the protein has to be correct. That adds astronomical order of magnitude of the combination, since the 3D shape cannot be random. Examples of this. Two, that time is long enough to find the correct combinations of all the proteins necessary for a species to come to existence. The answer to this is the Cambrian explosion. A very large number of species have appeared in a relatively short period of time, which is the Cambrian period, as we talked about it last time, two minutes on a 24 hour scale. Whatever the 24 hour represents, however million, millions of years, it doesn't matter. It just, if you scale this to 24 hours, the amount of time where the species all appeared, and that's why it's called an explosion. This is not an invention of people of faith. This is scientific. It's called the Cambrian explosion or the Cambrian period. The molecular formation in these species are so diversified. Hence the species themselves, which offer a huge challenge. Hence the species themselves are also diversified, which offers a huge challenge to the availability of time, to have enough time, for natural selection plus mutation to produce these very different phyla of species that appear in a very short period of time. Also, the probabilistic opportunities available since the Big Bang will not be enough chance for one amino acid to appear. In the evolution conference, uh, which is on orthodoxapologetics.org, and this part was covered by Kevin, um, it's a very, it's a mathematical part, very, very clear to challenge the chance that things could happen by chance. The summary, basically, you don't have enough time, but there is more detailed analysis than just time. It's called probabilistic opportunities. You don't have enough opportunities that makes this come by random. That's basically that, in essence, time is not enough to have this complex life to appear in its form in a very short period of time. At the very least, evolutionists are demanding for a modern theories to cope with the problem. So they themselves acknowledge after discovery of the complexity of how life is formed, which is the discovery of the order of information DNA, it became a huge challenge to explain how species really came uh, because uh, at the beginning in the 30s, it was just a nucleus, globule basically, that's the nucleus and the cytoplasm and the membrane. That's how the cell seen now the cell has so much computer ability 
in each single cell that makes it extremely difficult to explain. So that's what's called chance. When later information is needed to achieve a task, combinatorics and the time of trial and error may provide a reasonable chance, which is again the lock, and you have time to play with all of the combinations till you're able to open the lock. That's called, you open the lock by chance because you don't know the combination. When I tell you the first letter is one, for example, then I'm reducing the time needed because I'm in, I am reducing the, the randomness because I gave you one of the letters, so that created constraints. It's not completely absolute chance. There is now guided chance because I was able to constrain one of the numbers. I gave you two of the numbers, that's more constraints. These are by the way called the necessity, which is certain rules that I say, for example, in the lock, the first number has to be one and the second number has to be even. That's an example of putting necessity that reduces the chances, which means reduces the, uh, reduces the combinations that you have to play with, which means reduces the time needed to find the correct combination, which means chance plus laws or chance plus necessity has a better chance than just than just randomness alone, which is chance means random. Just when I call it here, chance just means randomness. Can randomness achieve life? And the answer is actually all, almost all scientists agree that no, chance or randomness by itself cannot achieve life. Chance plus necessity, which we're going to discuss now, will find an amazing discovery that it cannot also achieve life, but we'll, we'll get to it. So when little information is needed to achieve a task, uh, like three combinations or two combinations only on a lock or four, so the more, the more uh, information I need uh, is, is in the case when the more, uh, the more trials and errors I will have, to, I, I am going through, therefore I need more information to be able to achieve uh, success to find the result of the opening the lock. But when the amount of information is of the order of magnitude we're talking about here, a lock with 77 dials on it, that is the 10 to the power 77 combinations that that lock can produce. The order of what we're talking here, 150 amino acids, plus the three dish shape structure. So <laughs> then, then, uh, then there is no, there is no chance. Um, Natural selection itself is the single process in evolution that, it, that is the antithesis of chance. It is predictable. This is bogus. Natural selection is random. It says that within a specific environmental context, one genotype will be better than another genotype in survival or reproduction for certain reasons, having to do with the way its particular features relate to the environment or relate to other organisms within the population. That provides predictability. You know, that's the mechanism of how it works. And consistency. So if you have different populations with the same opportunity for evolution, you would get the same outcome. The problem with this view, natural selection is in motion once you have life and reproduction already occurring. So how would it explain the origin of life? What we're talking about here, where did life come from? Not how does natural selection operate? So what you described does not happen, Futuyama, the scientist, does not describe except the mechanism, reliable mechanism of the, what the outcome of the replication will be. But what we're talking about here, that Darwin did not use this discovery to systematically explain how the very first life appeared. So this system of evolution, this system which is the evolution, the natural selection happens when life is already in motion, when replication is already happening. So how would it explain the origin of life? Big, big challenge. Natural selection occurs once you have organisms, once you have organisms that can reproduce. But if there is no reproduction yet, then there is no natural selection to operate. Reproduction assumes the presence of a sequence specific DNA because that's replication. A cell copies to become a cell that has the same DNA as the first one. Where did this highly information content sequence specific 
which is the DNA, come from? Where does the information in it come from? Which is where did the information in the DNA come from? Remember, natural selection requires the DNA on which all of the operation happen, duplication and mutation. To replicate and to have mutation that it can become another species or another modification in eyes are different, whatever, something is longer than in the parent, in the child and the parent and so on. So this is what I put, uh, an actually, uh, Stephen Meyer uses as an example, is that somebody is walking who falls in a ditch, and then after he falls, he says, I will go home to get a ladder, that ladder is natural selection, to get me out of the hole. I will put the ladder in the hole to get out. So where is the fallacy here? He's already in the hole. How will he get, and he's saying, I will go out, and put a ladder in the hole to get me out of the hole, which is exactly how can I use natural selection to explain the origin of life while natural selection works only after life starts? How can I resort to that ladder that's natural selection to get me out of the hole? I don't have that ladder because life hasn't started yet. Reproduction hasn't started yet. So what do evolutionists do to avoid this? Chance, we agree that chance or randomness is a very far-fetched, and they agree to it almost all. That it's, it's very hard by randomness to life to start on its own. So chance plus necessity plus some sort of natural selection plus mutation should give rise to a mechanism that can self-replicate, because as we said, reproduction is needed for natural selection to act. Two, it is not the DNA because it would make them get trapped into where did the information come from. So they need a replication system that doesn't depend on the DNA because DNA has information. We'll come back to the same question. Where did the information DNA come from? So telling you from all of these mechanisms are having one or more of the following problems. They ascribe the specific information to protein, not DNA. And protein doesn't carry information. Again, they have to find a way for replication to happen. Because once replication happens, they can invoke natural selection is happening. So how does the replication happen? Your know, neuroplication happens because of the DNA and the information in it. That's the part that replicates. So we're trying to find a way that replication happened before the existence of the DNA in the evolution process of, of, of life. So they, make, they come up with theories that prove the protein can replicate without the existence of DNA. They ascribe the specific information to protein, not to the DNA. Two, they displace the problem. They move, they move it somewhere else. At some point in their explanation, there is a step that needs specific information. You just have to be alert enough to pinpoint it. This is for us, I'm telling you. So the information gets misplaced or the, the, the system gets moved for, to fool the students that something happened, it seems to be, yeah, that makes sense. There is no DNA here and replication. But in any part where replication is needed, you'll find that there's certain information that's needed. Cover this in all of the models that where they say, here is a replication without DNA. Because replication with DNA comes back to our challenge. Where did the information come from? So evolutionists had to create explanation of replication that can that replication can happen without DNA existing. Therefore, life can start on its own because replication means natural selection, means life and the choosing of what's best and so on. Even ignoring the Cambrian, because the Cambrian requires all of these life forms to appear very quickly, very short period of time compared to natural selection speed. Remember, an organism is bones and, and movements and, and connection of, of, of moving parts. And it's, it's, it's a very, very, very complex. And uh, the, 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 how the chest is formed, how the legs are formed, how the arms are formed, how feathers are formed, how eyes are formed, how the head is formed. There's so many diversification that to appear just in this gradual form uh, is extremely improbable. However, in order to stay with 
our analysis here, pay attention always. When people create models for replication before the DNA, at some point they will need information that enables the replication, but they don't admit it or show it. We have to be alert to pinpoint, oh, where, wait a minute, how did you get from this point to another? And, it, and it's not random. So um, to be trained to all of this requires a course by itself, but I'm just giving you the concepts here of what we are discussing is that we're able to establish certain very clear facts that the origin of life means the, the, where does the information come from? So chance and necessity. So chance means random. Necessity means rules or laws of nature to eliminate this randomness. Or by a mix of both in a certain order. So origin of life, evolution said that there were systems in play that preceded this information and that information is a result of natural forces. Things can happen by chance and allowed long time. Certain laws that make this information to appear on its own, for example, biochemical self-organization. So, okay, they're offering now that biochemical self-organization may replace information, be proceeding to it, and then information will appear later. So let's discuss this. So RNA model that preceded the DNA model, this is out of the scope of this class. It's very, very detailed. There's five models for it. Um, it would take another six hours to cover it in its entirety. So I will leave this, um, if we offer another advanced, just evolution, short course. Um, but but it's, it's again, look for the part where they jump and assume information. So now we're going to discuss the number three, uh, because laws guiding chance uh, may make life appear. So these laws definitely not magnetic fields, is, uh, not electrostatic fields, but it's biochemical attraction, or what we call biochemical laws, or biochemical self-organization, that the laws will mandate or will organize how things connect together. Let's see this. So chance plus time may do the trick. Applying this to DNA, there has to be a huge amount of information, and this information has to be encoded correctly in order to get the correct amino acid sequence that forms a certain protein, this information is so huge that it has to produce the correct amino acid order with the correct 3D shape. So one in 10 to the power 77. Is it necessity? So we'll describe the chance from this argument is very, very hard. Chance plus time cannot do that trick. You need infinitely longer amount of time. Is it necessity then, which is the self-organization biochemistry? Necessity means the natural laws of physics and chemistry affecting life. Biochemical laws are agreed upon to the forces of necessity at play. So let's discuss biochemical laws. The father of self-organization biochemical predestination. In 1968, chance hypothesis has weakened. So this randomness only, as every scientist knows, it's, it's, it doesn't hold water. Dean Kinian biophysicist at San Francisco State University states, if the association of amino acids were a completely random event, he himself states this, there would not be enough mass in the entire earth, assuming it was composed exclusively of amino acids to make even one molecule of every possible sequence of a low molecular weight protein. Kenyon and Steinman biochemical predestination. So, the father of biochemical predestination is admitting chance alone is impossible. That's his reference. Dean Kenyon, it is sometimes argued in speculative papers on the origin of life that highly improbable events such as the spontaneous formation of a molecule of DNA and a molecule of DNA polymerase in the same region of space at the same time become virtually inevitable over the vast stretches of geological time. No serious quantitative arguments, however, are given in support of such conclusions. So people who say it's going to happen, these formations of spontaneous formation on its own of a molecule of DNA and a molecule of DNA polymerase in the same region, just it's going to happen. He says, he, Kenyan himself says, no serious quantitative, this is what we told 
about um, Darwin. There is no systematic explanation of how his theory explains the origin of life. So Kenyon is saying the same language. No serious quantitative analysis arguments, however, are given in support of such conclusion. This is all saying that here is a scientist who will present to us the necessity approach or the self-organization laws in biochemistry. He himself is admitting chance will never ever do the trick. There's nothing concrete to prove that it could. Good, very, very good. Term replacement, Jacques Monod, the father of chance's necessity. Kenyon and Steinman replaced the word necessity because they dropped chance completely. <laughs> because as we said in the previous two slides, Kenyon is convinced completely this chance doesn't play. Um, and, they called, and they called the necessity a predestination. Laws of biochemistry will form things to be having a certain form. form. Or according to their focus, biochemical predestination. In book 1969, uh, in the 70s and 80s, became the best-selling graduate level book. So now we're going to get into necessity because chance is out by people who are scientists and saying it can never do this so the old approach of chance and necessity of jacques monod is even now became just necessity and kenyan calls it scientifically it's biochemical necessity or biochemical predestination or biochemical self-organization means predestination or self-organization is the same. The, the laws of biochemistry will do the trick, will do what we're talking about, because these are laws. These things attract one another, and that's called the laws that will control the whole process. To understand it, what is self-organization? What does it mean that laws take, take control and, and things that start with a certain shape have different shapes because of laws that cause them to modify? Um, so, an example of changing from one shape to another, increase in order of a system due to some natural process or force or a governing law. For example, water filling a sink. Now the water is stable, this is how it looks at the beginning, then you unplug the sink, the, the, the hole at the, the sink hole at the bottom. And the plug at the bottom is removed. Plug, what was blocking the hole at the bottom is removed, like this one. There is a, a sink, it has water, and the, there is a hole here that was plugged by a plug, and then you will remove the plug. Gravity, which is a law, which is a force, in case that, that's an action here, acts on the water, and the water swarms, swarms, swirls, forming a vortex. This is the vortex. This shape is called the vortex. The vortex wasn't there before, but when the bottom was unplugged, the water changed its shape from being in the form of a contained in a container to the shape of being a vortex. And the reason for this change of shape is because there is force called gravity. So forces or laws can act to make something change from one form to another. That is basically what is self-organization. To organize itself in another shape by itself, but due to forces acting. So this is basically what Kenyon will use to show that chemical forces will do a certain organization of how uh, the, the species or, or how the organism comes about or how the replication would come. So the vortex is a new structure that gets formed due to the natural force of gravity. Um, what is the difference between a group of metal pieces and a car? So the sum versus reductioning. Reduction is means it reduces the big complicated thing I'm talking about into very simpler pieces. Can I reduce a car into metal? What is the difference between a bunch of metals and a car? What is the difference between marble and a sculpture? What defines the difference between a functioning cell and the various molecules that jointly constitute it? So 
we're trying to say here that when you have all of the small pieces, it doesn't mean you can get the complicated big piece out of the small pieces. It doesn't mean that when you have all of the metals of a car, you can get the car itself. It doesn't mean when you have marble, you can get sculpture by just natural forces. It doesn't mean when you have all the chemicals of a cell, you can have the cell with all of its functionality. That's basically what reductionists are saying is that you can reduce the complicated to the parts of it, and then you can, which means that you can get it from it. And we say, no, this is not the same. The car is the sum of a lot of parts, but organized together, not vice versa. The, 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 the cell is a lot of chemicals acting all together. Does the whole reduce to the sum of parts? Or the other way around, do, do the properties of the parts explain the structure and organization of the whole? The answer is it depends. So it could be in some cases. Iron or aluminum is used to make gears in the car, gearbox, or in the pistons. The iron is used to make the piston rod, the piston head, the camshaft, and so on. It's the same metal, iron, but the material does not infer the functionality of what the iron was used for, a gear, a rod, a piston head, a cam, or the camshaft on the camshaft. There are a set of minimum parts for the car to function. But the complexity of the car cannot be reduced to just iron, although the iron is what makes everything in the, in the, in the car, for example. So, but the car cannot be reduced to just iron. The sum, which is the car, prevails. And you cannot explain the system, the sum, by reducing to what it's built of. I cannot reduce the car, which is the sum, which is the word. I cannot reduce it, the word reductionism, into forming into iron. Uh, we'll see how this helps here. On the other hand, the whole can be reduced to the parts. That's why we said it depends. So in some cases you can, is when you bring a magnet close to iron filings. When you put it and you bring a magnet, these filings, these small, very strands of iron, will trace. Like, المغناطيسي, will trace the invisible magnetic field lines and form a shape. And this is attributed to two things only, iron properties and the force of magnetism. Then you can reduce the sum to the parts. But in the case of the car, you can't. In the case of this, you can. So because there is certain force acting, this force, when you put the force of magnetism, قوة المغناطيسية, when you put it in the with iron filings, it's enough to form the shape. In case of a car, it's not enough for iron to form a car. So in, that's why the answer is it depends. Some systems, you can reduce it to what it's made of, which is the system of how the iron looks in the place of a magnet. You can reduce it to one thing. It's the force of the magnet, or the magnetic field lines. In other cases with the complex system, you cannot do this trick. So that's why the answer was, it depends. Can we reduce the complex to the sum of its simpler parts? It depends. In the car, it can't. In the magnet and the iron pieces, it can. And it can because we can describe very clearly that it's one force that's forming it. So applying it here, sum is reducible. A salt crystal has a lattice. The shakli, the whole sodium chloride crystal, the malh, with the repetitive pattern. This structure resulted from the natural law of electrostatic attraction between the positively charged sodium ion and the negatively charged chlorine ion. Note that the pattern is repetitive. So I can reduce this whole lattice of sodium chloride into the, into the, the pattern it's from because the pattern keeps repeating. It's just a bigger version of what the small module is. So the small module of the pattern is basically this cube, sodium and chlorine, this cube. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. That's enough. And it gets repeated. So I can reduce the sodium crystal into the smallest form of it. Here is the sum is reducible. 
Applying it here, sum is reducible. A salt crystal has a lattice structure that has strikingly repetitive pattern. The structure resulted from the natural law of attraction. I think this is, I'm repeating it. Um, Self-organization can be repetitive, but chaotic. Here is, for example, snowflakes. Yeah, it repeats, but it's random, and it forms shapes that are random. This is actually explained by chaos theory. Very, very used as snowflakes. So this is a, a, a complex shape, but random. But it's reduced to one unit. Just, just one, this one unit, when it sh you shape it differently and you copy it, it gives you whatever shapes it does. So still, this is the sum is reducible. So is there a biological predestination, i.e. physical or chemical forces that make the production? Can information be produced by chemistry, like information in the DNA? Here is the golden question. I want you to pay 100% attention. We have been laying here the concepts to this question. So if Kenyan, who is not a religious person and does not subscribe to God, and he said, chance is no chance. Randomness, no chance. There's no way that they can prove that randomness can do the trick. So the next thing which made us this understand the sum versus reduction led us to can, can predestination of biochemistry, which is the biochemistry laws, that's basically what predestination is, laws that will control the, the outcome. Can it be responsible to explain to us that this was the source of information, the information came from biochemistry by themselves. And I was saying that the question is, where does information come from? So Kenyan is taking the task saying, biochemist, biochemistry can be the result of generating information. As gravity was the result to take the shape of the water at the beginning to make it form into a vortex. I hope we're getting the link here. If not, we'll, we'll have questions and answers at the beginning of the next lecture. Um, as we said, this one is pre-recorded because of travel requirement on Wednesday. So back again here, can biochemistry laws generate information, create information from the biochemistry laws? So Kenyan's model, Kenyan can, offers the theory that it should, it can. So let's discuss it. Simple monomers, sugar instead of polymers, monomers. Sugar amino acid bases arose from simpler atmospheric gases and energy. Proteins, polymers, that's, the, that's polymers are forms of multiple monomers. Mono is mono, poly is many. And DNA arose from monomers. So he's now saying the, the, the hierarchy. Sugar amino acid bases arose from simpler gases and energy, and then it gives these give monomers, and monomers give polymers. Positive membranes formed around these. He's explaining how chemistry can explain how life or the first cell cells formed. Then step number three: primitive membranes formed around these polymers. Primitive metabolism emerged inside these membranes as various polymers interacted chemically together. Operin, the one who described origin of life using UV and, and, and um, or in a certain encapsulation of um, certain things in, 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 um, in, in biology, it encapsulated certain chemistry. This certain chemistry created proteins and from it came life. So operin relied on chance variations to achieve some of the chemical transformation. That's another scientist. So we'll leave him for now. So in reference three, in the same fashion that the difference in the nature of reactivity of the units of growing in organic crystal determines the final constitution of the three-dimensional crystal array. So differences in reactivities of the various amino acids with one another could possibly, could possibly serve to promote a defined ordering. And I was trying to explain where is the order came from of sequencing the growing peptide chain. 
the order of the amino acid to form that protein. So he's offering a series. And it's the, this is a th hypothesis, a theory. In the same fashion that the difference in the nature of reactivity, so chemical interaction, chemical attraction, chemical affinity of the units of growing in organic crystal determines the final constitution of the three-dimensional crystal array. So as chemistry affinity of the chemical th constituents of a crystal shape it in a certain way. It says the same model, the same model, that which is different to activities or attractions or affinities of the various amino acids with one or other could possibly, that's the hypothesis. This is he's not saying this is definitely what's happening here. This could possibly serve to promote a defined ordering, this chemistry attraction could define what's come after amino acid number one, amino acid number two, amino acid number three, and hence form the protein of the growing peptide chain. We'll discuss it before the amino acid order is called a peptide chain. That's a hypothesis, and that's what he's explaining here. Specific amino acids bond more readily with some amino acids than others. Example, glycine with alanine twice as much as glycine with valine. Also, this, he's explaining now there is biochemical attractions. Also, they seem to be related to chemical structure of these uh, components. Amino acids with longer side chains bond less frequently to a given amino acid than do amino acids with shortened side chains. So, explaining that the structure of the amino acid makes it, it ex explains its ability to bond with another easier or harder based on a discovery that it's related to the length of the amino acid. This is due to, it doesn't matter what it's due to, but he says that there is a reason for this. What he's trying to do is that there is chemical laws that govern the attraction and probably these chemical laws is what showed us how these things are in order together. So he's using just natural biochemistry to give us the order, order, hell key. Who, who decides on that order, how it gets done? So he's saying here, it's basically chemistry. Conclusion, these affinities impose constraints on the sequencing of amino acids, which would introduce non-randomness. So he's trying to say the protein can come on their own on the beginning of the whole thing without the information DNA, what, what, is, what, is, what is the sequence here? We're trying to explain how protein conform without the existence of DNA. Now we explained the translation, transcription, translation in the protein form because of the DNA method of mRNA and tRNA and so forth. Tab. DNA exists means I, I, they will get stuck with the question we're posing. Where is the information and DNA come from? So they say, no, 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 there is proteins that formed in the sequence of the appearance of life before DNA existed. DNA is came in the evolutionary process. And here it is how we think it formed, is that chemistry played a role to order the amino acids in that order before the DNA existed. This is in a way trying to explain how proteins came before DNA. And because we, in our explanation, DNA is the reason, and we explain the mechanism clearly, how proteins are generated. And it's very straightforward and very clear because of, but it's, it's information heavy. It has to have information for this to happen. So because people are trying to, or scientists are trying to say that evolution only is the reason. So they have to come up with a way that protein existed in a certain order of amino acids, because Kenyan subscribes to the fact that this order cannot be random, and the chance by forming it is impossible. So he's explaining here that biochemistry forces formed proteins in a certain order of amino acids, unique to the protein, before the existence of DNA. And with evolution, DNA started appearing, and then now the system appears the way it looks. So let's, then we're trying to explain the origin of life. And we say the origin of life is the DNA. DNA is in fact 
the origin of life because the origin of life is an information question and the only place where we see information carried that's responsible for the whole thing we see it carried in the DNA. It carries a lot of information. So they are trying to form life without the need of information, just using chemistry. In this case, using chemistry. Possibly, continuation back to the hypothesis, possibly also correlate with the specific sequencing motifs typical in a function protein. Kinney and Steinman achieved that origin of biologic information happened first on proteins. Quais, they admit that biologic information happened first in protein, not in DNA. Then once primitive metabolic function had arisen, had arisen did DNA and RNA need to come into play? Number one, this is a hypothesis. In order to explain the existence of protein prior to the existence of DNA. And DNA came later as part of the evolutionary process in forming life. How? It's still not explained. But at least they're trying to explain the origin of life without the presence of DNA. So here is his offering that biochemistry is able to put laws on how the amino acids connect together forming the protein and this protein became the origin of carrying information because these proteins will start forming the dna I'm going to present a very nice clear challenge to kenyan's approach and it really comes from information theory just bear with me it's coming so in fact Kenyon himself began to doubt his own theory. 1975 challenged by a student of his, of his called Solomon Darwin, San Francisco State University about, a challenge about can Kenyon model explain the origin information in the DNA? Kenyon had two options to explain information DNA. The specific sequences of amino acids had somehow provided a template for sequencing the bases, the CGTU the four main bases we'll talk about that each three forms a uh, a, uh, and a codon and anticodon uh, the guanine the cytosine the th thymine and the uracil in a newly formed dna molecule or well, this is how this all has to come from protein forming itself by these chemical attractions to form the dna molecule the double helix or dna itself self-organized in the same way he and Steinman proposed proteins had, which is due to chemical attraction to the amino acids, the DNA, the protein formed, and it's the same mechanism caused the DNA helix to form also by just chemical laws between the nucleotides, alohoma, guanine, cytosine, thymine, and uracil. All chemistry, all attraction forces, and these attraction forces formed the DNA. Great, he's home free. Information formed by chemistry, and that's how the information is created inside the DNA. Now, chemistry, as the way protein forms by itself, by attraction, biochemical attraction, in the amino acids form the protein. That same method can be applied. That also these form the DNA. This is purely hypothesis, but he says this could be the case. Now, know this will be the way to explain how the DNA shape looks like and how it, how it has this information. But now he explained how the information came from. He's trying to answer our question, how the information, where the information came from. This is the second option. The first option is the specific sequences of amino acids had somehow provided a template for sequencing the bases. So these four, due to the attraction between them, somehow were able to arrange itself to form the information in the DNA. Let's analyze this. So here is the, the, the CG and TNA attra uh, attractions. The, so the G and the U and the C and the T attractions. And Answer to the first point, which is the specific sequence of the amino acid had somehow provided a template for sequencing the bases, 
CGTU and in newly formed DNA molecules, newly formed by themselves by the chemistry of the attraction. Answer. Information flows, flows from the DNA to proteins and not vice versa. All evidence point to this. So, Mr. Kenyon, the fact that you are trying to say that the protein provided the information is challenged now by the discovery that all discoveries point to that proteins are formed from the DNA, not vice versa. So, RNA codon set abides to more than one amino acid. And this is the one that carries the protein information. Two, the many to one relationship is in that direction from the DNA or the mRNA to the amino acid. How can this be three to one can be pointed to oppositely? Like if I have this, this is the protein. If the information flows from the protein to the DNA, then I will go from this to here, but which one will it be? So the fact that it's many to one, this is in mathematics tells you right away information flows in this direction from the DNA to the amino acid because the amino acid is not uniquely connected to this one. This could be three forming the same amino acid or two pointing to the same amino acid or one to one. So the flow of information is from the DNA to the amino acid formation, i.e. each triplet of DNA bases and corresponding RNA codon specifies exactly one amino acid during the transcription and translation. Yet, some amino acids correspond to more than one nucleotide triplet. So if the information goes from the amino to the, R to the DNA, according to Kenyon, that the protein formed first, and from it, the DNA got formed, sorry, there's a mathematical problem, Kenyon, you have, is that it was discovered that more than one codon can point to one protein or one amino acid. So if the order of the, or the direction of information is from the amino acid or the protein to form the DNA, it, it wouldn't work because there's ambiguity here. There is one too many, so which one would it choose? But when it's many to one, then definitely when I have this or this or this, it will form this then it has to be, this has to be the father of this. This has to be coming before this. This has to be existing to point to this, which challenges that amino acid came before, or amino acid form protein, which became the father of the DNA. That doesn't, is not correct, because of this discovery that this relationship is many to one. It's amazingly clear and, 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 and scientifically sound when it's many to one, the information, or this has to be the parent of this, because he knows that these three connect to one, not vice versa. This assures that unambiguity is only in one direction, which is codon to amino acid relationship, which means that codon came first, which means the DNA came first that has these codons ordered in certain order. Three, DNA proteins do not possess two anti-parallel strands of identical information. DNA proteins, the proteins themselves, protein cannot be unwound. DNA can be unwound, can be opened. Protein can't. And copied the same way DNA can. Also unwound, denatured. Proteins are highly active due, ex due to exposed amino acid and carboxyl group and expose side chains, this is details. So DNA has certain properties that makes it able to carry stable information. Protein can't. Most denatured proteins tend to, this is about, denatured means open or the, or the, 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 the carboxyl group is exposed and they suffer from this that makes it unstable. Cross-link and aggregate. Uh, they get destroyed quickly in the cell. They lose the 3D structural ability, hence lose their functionality too. Four, DNA molecule is stable chemically, inert, maintaining its chemical structure and composition, while other molecules copy its formation. information. Amazing. So when the DNA opens and it gets copied, 
or when the DNA gets replicated, it's still stable. It doesn't break. Being stable, great storage device for information. Being stable makes it a great storage device for information. It does not get damaged. While info is read out in translation when we form the protein or replication when the DNA is copied. Again, it's a DNA as a stable molecule. These are four challenges to Kenyan saying that the protein is the father, could be the father of the DNA, not vice versa. Because when the DNA is the father of the protein, which is four reasons here to support this, we're gonna tell us, or we're going to come back to our question, where does information come from that's stored in the DNA? So to explain as we're talking, to make you not confused, Kenyan is trying to prove that DNA can come after protein because he's trying to explain that the protein, the information in the DNA comes from protein and protein is formed due to chemical self-organizing forces. Like you don't need somebody to insert information. This is all chemistry. And we proved here was four things, a challenge to this theory. Five, new theories by late 1980s showed that these chemical affinities do not correlate these chemical attractions do not correlate with actual sequencing path patterns in large class of known proteins so these affinities between the nucleotides does not match the large uh, with actual patterns in the large class of known proteins so your laws that can constrain the attractions or that can define the attractions between these chemical these chemicals do not match the randomness we see in these chemicals or the certain forms or patterns that would not follow your laws or the chemistry laws. The sequences of amino acids, on the other hand, never fail to follow information, never fail to follow information in DNA. mRNA forms this amino acid. This is always matching. Six, Kenyon, knowing the chemical structure of the DNA molecule, himself doubted that DNA possessed any self-organizational properties. Analogous to that, he had identified in amino acids on proteins. So I identified biochemical self-organization in amino acid or proteins. That's his hypothesis. But when he looked at the DNA itself, again, with theories coming up, he himself doubted later on his own theory. This position of his strengthened by reading an essay by Michael Polanyi, Hungarian physical chemist. In fact, we shall show now that it must not have self-organization properties, otherwise it cannot carry information. We want to show that DNA must not have self-organization properties. We're gonna, this will get, will get very, very clear now, but it's the most important part to understand. So, this is a summary of all what we had now about the DNA, the forming of the RNA in the transcription, and it becomes, through the translation, becomes the protein. We covered this in last week and this week also so far. So, um, tRNA also has no chemical affinity in whatever type of amino acid. Again, we're challenging Kenyan that he has said biochemistry laws is in control of all of this. We'll tell him, here is a small challenge. Where the amino acid attaches, it doesn't matter what type of amino acid it attaches to the same chemistry here. So there's no chemical laws binding this. So tRNA has no affinity of whatever protein, of whatever amino acid it's carrying. It's, in, it's indifferent. There is matching between the anticodon and the amino acid, but the amino acid attaches here no matter what type of amino acid it is, and it, this is always the same chemical attachment, so it's indifferent. There's no chemical laws. There is no chemical laws that decide this ACC has to connect to something specific. In fact, anything connect to this ACC. So there's no. Or this is this is a flexibility. Once you see flexibility, then you see okay, this your 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 theory of chemical attraction is not holding here. That's one part. 
And it's explained here, the amino acid connects always to ACC, so there is no dependency between the tRNA connection, we call it the three inch or the three prime connection, three inch, the pre three prime connection point and the amino acid connecting to it, which is what we just said here. Once you find flexibility, that's op or, or, or options, that's opposite to laws. Laws means that this has to attach to this. There is no, there is, as we said, as many to one relationship between the anticodons and the amino acid. There is, there is so that we can answer, this is so that we can answer definitive that self-organization biochemical forces does not play any role in the information, which means the information is free. It has to come from an outside source, which is the question we pose here. Where does the information come from? And we're disproving that Kenyan is saying chemistry inserts the information. We'll tell him, wait a minute, let's look at the RNA structure. Um, let's look at the DNA um, molecule. If, and it's the, the, the alphabet here is adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. They attach in this the A to the T and the G to the C, always this is the case. So chemistry does the following. There is attachment of the nucleotide to the back wall of the helix, this, this blue one. This attachment is always the same, independent whether it's attaching a T or an A. That's another flexibility. So there is no laws controlling who attaches because the attachment molecule here is the same in all cases. And this attachment is hydrogen attachment in all of them. So one type of attachment, whether it's A to a T or C to a G or T to an A or G to a C. So one connection fits all. That's also flexibility. It's always hydrogen here, independent of what's connecting. And it's also one type of connection here, independent of what nucleotide is attaching to the wall of the, of the helix. So both of these forces are identical. The orange are the same for independent types of nucleotides. And this attraction is the same, a hydrogen attraction, independent of what, which two it's connecting but these are the self-organization forces or the chemical affinities in the DNA. So there are bonds between sugar and phosphate groups forming the two twisting backbones of the DNA molecule. This is, we're describing here all of the bonds, all of the affinities, all of the attachments. There are bonds fixing individual nucleotide, whether it's a C or a T or a G or an A, bases to the sugar phosphate backbones on each side of the molecule. There are hydrogen bonds stretching horizontally, forming complementary pairs between nucleotide bases. So there is these forces, this force, this force, this force, this force, this force, this force. That's one type of force. And there is this force, the hydrogen. Addition in different bond N, Glycosidic bond occurs between occurs the base and the backbone. So this this N glycosidic bond, regardless of which base, whether it's a T or an A or a C or a G, it's the same type of bond called the N glycosidic bond. I'm just reiterating their names in case, of course, as having background in biochemistry, you can use them. I don't care. I'm just caring about that. This force is the same type of bond independent of what type of nucleotide it's bonding to the helix. And this bond is hydrogen independent with which, which bond it is between the T and the A or the C and the G. All four bases are acceptable. None is chemically favored. In fact, effect of organic chemistry properties of DNA molecule. But there are no bonds between the bases along the longitudinal axis in the center of the helix. 
there is no bond in this direction. There is no bond in this direction here. That is the million dollar discovery. There is no bond along this. Are there any chemical affinities along this direction? No. There is no chemistry. There is no self-organization. Because if there's self-organization, they would repeat. Because it's the same attraction. So the same order would repeat all the time. Then the DNA carries no information. Again, along this axis, so along here, there is a force. And that force is independent of what nucleotide it's tying to the helix. Along these two, the nucleotides together, there is a force, the hydrogen bonding force. But again, it's only hydrogen bonding independent of what to its bonding. These forces are the same, independent of what's bonding. And this makes it able that along the vertical axis, there is no way any bonding is happening. It's free. And this makes the order of information in this direction free. So the DNA can carry information. If there is chemical bonding along this vertical axis, then the DNA will have just repeated same four orders. Then it carries zero information because I know what's the next four are. I know what's the next four are. I know because it's just repetitive. And that is the billion dollar discovery is that along the direction of carrying information, information is free. You can put any order or it carries any order. So who put that order? It can't be chemistry. We proved just now it cannot be chemistry because chemistry affinity only appears to connect this to the wall and it's always the same bond and only appears to connect the two together and it's always the same type of bond. But vertically, they are free. The fact that this is A and a T does not mandate to know the next one, whether it's a GC or a CG. Hence, this double helix can carry free order of information. Hence, the double helix can carry free order of information, which means, in another example, if the double helix is the paper, and the paper has chemical attraction to the ink of the pen, Yet there is chemical attraction between the paper and the ink of the pen. I can still use it to write any message. I am here. I don't know if it looks correctly or not. It looks maybe the, the other, the old opposite mirror. Anyway, I am here. So the chemical attraction between the ink and the paper does not control or limit me what type of message I write on the paper. Imagine this is a magnetic board. I use this in the conference as a demo. And I have magnetic letters on it, like the ones you stick on a, on a, on a fridge. The magnetism property, which makes the letter stick to the, mag, to, the, to, the magnetic, to the iron sheet, the magnetic letter, does not control what message I write. I can write any message with these letters. That's exactly what's here. The magnetic forces, sorry, the biochemical or the chemical forces that are at a play at here does not limit me from whatever order I can put. Hence, this is why the DNA is able to carry information because of the freedom where the information is carried, which is vertically, there is no forces to control what comes next. That is a big deal. And that is how this DNA structure is capable of carrying any type of information, any order, which brings us back to the question, who put that order? Not where it's stored. We prove to Kenyan now that it's stored in a way that biochemistry has to be a force that is at play only along this direction. So Mr. Kenyon, when you say that 
chemical forces helped forming information, we tell him it's exactly the opposite. Information is stored along the direction where there are no forces to limit it. Because if there were, and I know that order because of the forces, it will make that order specific. Same order every time because it's, this is the chemical attraction between them. Then I lose information. Then the DNA carries zero information because by information theory, if I know what the, the next symbol is or what the next piece of information is, then that piece of information carries zero data, zero information because it's predicted. It's 100% it's accurate, uh, sorry, 100% certain. And we say when an event happens with certainty, certainty 100%, then this event carries no information because I know to begin with that it's happening. It's going to happen. That is the whole essence of defying and explaining that biochemistry cannot explain where information comes from, which is what Kenyon tried to do by saying biochemistry formed proteins because it can mandate the order of the amino acid, and these proteins, proteins became the parents of information to the DNA, which came after them. And we we'll say every single proof points to the opposite, and the proof from information theory that for a system to carry information, it has to be able to be free to have any information in it, like a page of a novel, you can be free to write any letter on it, or a hard drive, you can be free to put any type of document on it with ordered words, or ordered ones and zeros, then it can carry information. And that's how the DNA is able to carry information because the direction of information does not have chemical forces. This vertical direction is free. This is the great discovery by looking into information theory with biochemistry because this theory comes from information theory that information or the next symbol has to be having a probability of it's happening. It has to be not for sure it will happen, otherwise it carries no information. So here is why there is no laws of attraction along this direction, why biochemical self-organization does not work along this direction. In fact, if it did, why would that make the whole system fail, which is what we just described? Hint, to give you the, I gave already the answer, but this was part of the presentation to let them think through it. If it did, you would have, you would get a repeated pattern because the order of the chemical attraction would work vertically. Then you get always the repeated pattern. As if you're making a phone call and saying toot, 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 toot. That's an information that, a phone call that has a sound, but doesn't have information. So that, in, that pattern will be forced by the chemical affinity and it will limit you from having, it will be zero and the DNA would fail and everything would fail. So I'm getting again back into the information theory and communication theory, but we'll describe this earlier. So I will skip it here. I will leave it for you to, if you want to read more, but that's putting it here again to uh, explain. This is exactly the in engineering and communication theory. You have a sound wave, you digitize it. So that's called the source, you transmit it. And then there's a channel, which is whether it's the air or, or, or a wire. Then you receive it, and then you should recover it identically. But there is something called noise here that could damage it. So this gets solved by Claude Shannon, who was able to be the father of encoding and decoding and error correcting code and error detection code. All of these are heavily, heavily, heavily used in digital communication. So I will leave it for you to enjoy this part. But this is this is the freedom of information because you can store it. Whatever you want to put can be stored. And the DNA has to be flexible to put any order of information in it. So all of these are digital systems. So this shows us that these chemical affinities are appearing in a certain direction, but disappearing completely along this direction, because this direction has to be free without constraints. So I'm repeating here. So, yeah. 
This is the axis that carries information. That's basically why we don't find chemical attraction along this axis. That's the direction. And that's the direction in which DNA carries the information, which has showed us how to use it to use an mRNA to generate a protein. The information is encoded along this direction. So amazingly sound proof that still we have proved that chance, even Kenyan himself says chance is not enough. Biochemical self-organization or laws of biochemistry that will what would be the reason to insert information, we proved now that these laws of biochemist chemical affinities do not appear along the direction where information is, which is which means it cannot be the source of information. And we prove from information theory, definitely that makes sense because information to for something to carry information, it cannot be carrying a predicted pattern, which would happen if biochemistry is controlling this direction, if biochemical attraction is controlling this direction. This very part, I am in, 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 in want that every person understand and we'll cover it in Q&A um, after in, in the next lecture. So I am Coptic is information. AABB, 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 although it's a message being sent, it has no information. Because once you get the first AABB, AABB which would be the chemical biochemistry solution is that you get the same order all the time you know that the next one is aabb and the third one is aabb so this is this is this is this is a message that has no information it's a message but it has no information dna carries information for the whole organism it has to be very very um, ordered according to the person who put it exactly as a piano when you keep pressing the same button it's the same note on the musical note appearing all the time for pages and pages. That is music. Or that's the sound of the piano, but it's not music. Or So you're tied to always press this button or the one, this button, the one next to it, this button, the one, because this is the attraction forces between the two buttons. It, it limits you to go to, into another but another key, I mean, a key I'm calling it button. All of these are, are examples to show the same the same concept or the same idea is that chemical forces disappear, don't exist along the direction of carrying information. Because if it existed, the, the, the system would not be able to carry information because it would be limited, tied. So chemical self-organization only applies in direction that carries no information, whereas it disappears completely, hence we're able to, in the direction that carries information. That answers Kenyan's source of appearance of life that your explanation does not answer that question at all. So chemistry and physics do not explain information. Michael Polanyi, life in life a reproducible structure about dna science journal living organisms contain a communication system gene expression system in which dna stores information for building proteins copies itself replicates protects it's a stable system the data can be read out of it in the replication and translation fault tolerance my addition to this, it's an operating system and also does machine learning. This is completely out of the scope now, but all of these are telling us laws of physics or chemistry do not determine the arrangement of characters, i.e. the message that convey information. DNA does not reduce to the chemistry it's made of, which one will discuss the sum versus reductionism, i.e. from the physical or chemical forces it is made of DNA. Information did not originate from such forces. Polanyi argued DNA's capacity to convey information requires freedom from chemical constraints or determinism. Is there freedom in the bonding? Yes, information is along the vertical axis of the helix. Dice has to be free to fall on any face for it to convey equally the information of one to six. Otherwise, if, it's a, if it has a certain weight to make it biased, that it always falls on three, the dice does not convey information. You cannot use it. It's always going to fall on three. That would be a self-organization. 
Hence, it cannot carry information. Otherwise, if it is weighted, say, to fall on a one all the time to one or more sides more than the others, then dice is not free to convey the same amount of information. If vertical is not free, if the bonding properties of nucleotides determine their arrangement capacity of DNA to convey information, would be destroyed because that order would be GCTA, 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 just self, sorry, not self, replicating sequence, which means zero information. Because each nucleotide will determine the next one. This, this way we will just, we will just get a repeated deterministic pattern. This conveys no information. It has no probabilistic uncertainty. A probability of A that, a probability of B um, that of, of, uh, of probability of A provided, happening provided that B is happening equal one, then A conveys no information because we know that it happens after B. Information conveyed of, by event A is zero because once B happens, I know that A is next. So the, seeing A doesn't give me any surprise, any piece of, new piece of information. Conclusions, information source is the true origin of life question. Where does the information come from? The information is measurable using the information theory and communication theory. Self-organization biochemistry laws do not succeed to describe origin of life. Much in future conferences or talks, um, but I, I hit here a very, very important chord that I want you to digest very well and I want you to describe uh, this concept as I will write for you in the assignment the terms that I want to you to define so I will stop the recording here and I will send it in uh, on the dashboard uh, in order to make it clearer what would the first assignment uh, terms will be but uh, please pray for me and I hope this is understood because this offers a systematic way of proving that the origin of life is the origin of information. Where the, it has to, we have to answer the question, where does information come from? Darwin provided a mechanism to look in the past through the, few, through the present, but he did not systematically explain how this mechanism can explain the origin of the existence of life. In fact, his mechanism requires reproduction while life needs to come to existence first before reproduction happens. Using chemistry to bring life into presence would work in the 30s and the 20s, but after the complexity of the cell is discovered, people like Kenyon who try to use biochemical self-organization to insert using this mechanism information into the cell, we proved very clearly it failed. In fact, it's scientifically engineering wise, communication wise, information theory wise fails because chemistry does not, chemistry at affinities do not exist and must not exist along the axis for carrying information, which is where it's carried in the DNA, the vertical axis. And that is really the engineering approach that we use to prove systematically that still information and its freedom were inserted in the DNA from a source. It's not coming from within the chemical affinity of the proteins. And glory be to God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen.